Amen. So the title of this evening's ser uh, sermon is The Suffering of the Slothful. The Suffering of the Slothful. And of course, slothful is not something that, a word that we use a lot uh, today, but what it basically means is somebody who's very lazy. It's a biblical word for somebody is lazy. You might even heard somebody call or refer to a lazy person as a very slothful person. And of course, we're all familiar probably with the animal that we call a sloth. And why do we call it a sloth? Because of how slow and it moves. So and that's kind of what I want to talk about tonight is the fact that if you are a slothful person, you can expect to suffer in life. You know, life is not going to go easy for you. There are going to be difficulties that you don't, uh, you know, have to necessarily have, but because you've chosen to become a slothful person, you will suffer the consequences. You know, we can't just, you know, uh, move through life and, and, and just make whatever decisions we want and think that there aren't going to be any consequences. Look, there's always a consequence for every decision that you make in life. And when it comes to being a slothful or lazy person, you can mark it down that you are going to suffer, that there is going to be some degree of suffering in life, probably in proportion to the degree to which you are a sloth. The lazier you are, the more you're going to suffer. So look there in, in Proverbs chapter 6, and we're going to be in Proverbs a lot tonight because this is a topic that the book of Proverbs addresses over and over and over and over again. But we will be coming back to Proverbs chapter 6, so keep something there. But it says in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6, Go to the ant thou sluggard, which is just another word to describe somebody who is slothful, someone who is lazy or sedentary. Uh, he says, Thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man." So it's showing us here, first of all, that one of the things you will suffer from, from being a slothful person, is that you will become poor. You will not have what you need to survive. You will not have the money that you need to get by. Uh, you know, it says right there, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth. You know, it's referring to the fact that, you know, as, as a woman that is in labor, going through birth, you know, and, or as thy want as an armed man. Why is he using these illustrations? Well, I think that's because of the fact that when you're in those situations, you know, if you're a woman that's giving birth or you are being held up at gunpoint, you know, you getting out of that situation is kind of beyond your control. You know, that situation kind of has you uh, in its grasp, as it were. Uh, until it decides to let you go or it comes to an end, you know, you don't get to just choose when it's going to end. It will end on its own accord. Uh, you know, anyone who's, I don't know if anyone here has been held up, you know, been mugged or anything, but I imagine, you know, you kind of, you know, ask the mugger, hey, how long is this going to take, you know, or can we be done with this now? You're kind of at his mercy, you know, when he gets everything he wants, then he moves on. You know, ladies that have given birth, they could testify the fact that, you know, the baby doesn't give you a date and, a, you know, and make an appointment when it's going to, you know, when it's going to show up. You kind of have to just go through that process. Some births are longer than others. So I believe that's the illustration there. That's why he's using that. He's saying, thy poverty shall come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. You know, you're going to find yourself to be a poor person, and you know what? It's going to take probably more work than you're willing to give to get out of that situation. You know, people dig themselves into a hole, and sometimes that hole gets so deep that they just throw up their hands and say, I guess this is where I'm at. And they're stuck there. <clears throat> they're being held by their poverty, in a sense. So that's one of the things you'll suffer as a slothful person. And, you know, we don't have to look very far. In fact, we only need to look at the end of this street down by the freeway to see people in that exact position. You know, I came off the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the freeway today on the exit ramp and counted one, two, three, four, five, six people on my way down here just from there to here, which is what, probably a half mile of people that fit this bill, people that have become slothful in life, lazy in life, and are just, you know, being held there now, probably, in a lot of cases, by the bonds of their own sin. You know, they've gotten hooked on drugs, they've just become such, you know, habitually lazy people that they don't want to get up and do a day's work. What is the other thing that leads to it? Well, at least to what also I saw this morning, a lot of people at, you know, 9, 10 o'clock, you know, in the morning, when everybody's already getting up and going about their day, people are rushing off to work to put in an honest day's labor, you know, they're on the side of the road, with their head in their lap, 
you know, waiting uh, to get up and start begging. And that's another thing that slothfulness will, uh, or something that causes slothfulness rather, is sleeping. Becoming a very just sleepy person who just wants to sleep all the time. And look, we covet our naps. You know, we were talking about that earlier today. You know, uh, and I was telling somebody, man, I, I would just love an opportunity to spend a, a, a Saturday afternoon at home, you know, like two in the afternoon and pass out on my couch and with the windows open and, and listen to everybody else cut their grass or if they have grass around there, I don't even know. But, you know, listen to the birds chirp and the wind come in and have a nice, you know, leisurely nap, you know, but it's, that's something that's rare and it's something that I enjoy when I get it. And it's certainly not a way of life like it is for a lot of people who are slothful and lazy. You know, this reminds me of, you know, the, the, the proverbial, you know, teenager who wants to sleep in late into the morning. You know, a mom and dad, get up, get up, get up. When are you going to get out of bed? When are you going to get out of bed? Stop bothering me. Stop bothering me. You know, my dad had the trick. He, you know, I don't know what goes on in your house or if this is even a problem. It was with me for a little while. My dad would walk in with a cold, wet washcloth. And if I was there too long, just whack right in the face. Just if you just walk in, whack, and then, you know, walk out. And then that would that usually wakes you up when you get slapped in the face by a cold wet washcloth and it slides down and it gets to the pillow and soaks everything. At that point, you got to kind of get up, take care of the mess, and get the day going. So if that's a problem, I don't, I don't, I'm assuming it's not. But you know, hey, there's a little helpful tip. If you don't get anything else out of this, you know, if one day you have a teenager like that, you know what to do, right? So anyway, but sleeping or being a sleepy person or someone who's just overly concerned with just making sure that they get all the sleep that they want makes you a lazy, slothful person. You know, some people, they need to learn to just get up early and get after it. I mean, that's what it says here in verse 9. How long will thou sleep, old sluggard? He's not saying, you know, why do you sleep at all? He's saying, how long are you going to sleep? Why are you sleeping so long, thou sluggard? Somebody who's a slug, somebody who is a slothful is somebody who sleeps excessively or more than they need to. He says, when will thou arise out of thy sleep? Notice he says, yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. You know, it's a little and a little and a little. Well, a little and a little and a little adds up, right? Just 10 more minutes, just 15 more minutes, another 20 minutes. The alarm goes off, you're supposed to get up, you got stuff to do. 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. How many times you hit that snooze button, next thing you know, you've been sleeping through 10 consecutive snooze buttons, it's an hour later, and now you're running out the door, you know? And I get people, you know, that doesn't necessarily in and of itself make you a lazy person, but the point being that a little bit of this and a little bit of that can add up to a lot. And when you do that, when you let sleep, you know, and slumber just become who you are and what you're concerned with, and never, you know, uh, in getting up and getting after it, you know, you become a lazy or slothful person. Or how about this? How about just taking a nap in the middle of the day you know, on a work day. I've known people who've gone to work and find places to go nap. And you're like, where are they? And I'm saying more than one person. Multiple people in my work experience have I come across. I'll, they'll, we'll be working. I remember working at a furniture store. And uh, we were working, you know, doing whatever. And this guy, I mean, it was like 2, 3 in the afternoon. And when a coworker came up, and he's just like, oh, man. I just got a good solid 30 minutes in. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, I found a bunch of cardboard back there and that, around that storeroom. The dude, just in the middle of the day while everyone's working, not on his lunch break, nothing, doesn't punch out, just, yeah, I'm going to take a nap. You're a bum. That's lazy. You know, everyone gets, everyone gets tired. I understand that. We all have that, you know, afternoon slump. But, you know, if you just push through that and you work, chew a piece of mint gum or something like that, you know, snap out of it. Go wash your, you splash some cold water in your face. Thanks, Dad. You know, something to kind of snap you out of it and bring you back into it. You know, you'll get your second win. Right. You know, that 30 minutes of sleep is not going to make or break you. So sleeping or being a sleepy person is a source of slothfulness. That's what it says there in verse 9. How about will thou sleep? Be yet a little sleep. So shall thy poverty come. And you're going to suffer if that's the kind of person that you are. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, you don't think, you think, oh, what, what's this, what are you going on and on about sleeping? Well, the Bible talks a lot about it. The Bible goes on and on about sleeping and how it's a slothful, lazy thing to do. If it's something you do to excess. It says, you're going to Proverbs 24, it says, Proverbs 19, slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. 
You'll become a slothful person who's going to cast you into a deep sleep. You know what? It, sometimes it seems like the more you sleep, just the more tired you are. Yeah. You ever get so much sleep that you're just, you wake up too tired, you're like, oh, I'm just going to catch a quick power nap. And you, you sleep way longer than you probably should have. You're even more tired. Your body just wants to keep sleeping. You know, sometimes sleep is, is the enemy. You know, you got to stave that off. But it says an idle soul shall suffer, suffer hunger. The person that just wants to stay idle. You know, that same guy that thought it was real cute to go find some cardboard to catch a quick cat nap while everybody else is working, ended up getting fired. The idle soul shall, shall suffer hunger. You know, you become an idle person, a lazy person, you're not going to hold down a job. You're going to be fired after job, after job, after job. Because nobody wants to hire a lazy bum. You know, newsflash anybody who is looking for a job or is wondering what it takes to make it in, in, in the real world at a job. Employers are not begging for an opportunity to give you money. That's not what they're interested in. They're interested in you coming to work and making them money. That's what they want. That's what they're in business for. They want employees going to show up, put in a hard day's work, and not be concerned about you know, being sleepy or wanting to get a nap or only working so much or not doing more than they have to and so on and so forth. You know, they want people that want to show up and get after. Those are the people that are going to stay employed and that are going to excel at their jobs and be promoted. Again, look there, Proverbs chapter 20, verse uh, 30. Sleep is a source of slothfulness. It says, I went by the field of the slothful, by the vineyard of a man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. You know, those type of things that he's describing here do not happen overnight. Those are, yeah, exactly. They don't happen overnight. It's not like the guy woke up one morning and all this happened. These are things that take a very long time. I mean, we were up at the Veshvagawa Museum today, or the other day, yesterday, in fact, and that was, a, you know, a structure that stood for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But yeah, there were a lot of walls that had broken down, but they didn't break down yesterday. You know, it took a lot of time, had to go by, and, and things slowly begin to decay. So this is describing a guy who just sits back and is just being idle and is just watching everything around him, his own home, in fact, in his own dwelling, just slowly come down around him, just slowly be overgrown with thorns. And he says in verse 32, Then I saw and considered it well, and this is that's a really something that people need to do today. We should take a long look at the people that are standing on the side of the road begging. You know, and I'm sure there's a, there's a, a true case of, of poverty, that of someone who really just needs help here and there. But a lot of those people choose to be there. A lot of those people want to be there because it allows them to become lazy, sluggardly people. And whether they can sit there and lie to themselves all they want, they are suffering as a result of their decisions. And we should look and consider them well and, 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 and consider what it is that, uh, that they, they are involved in. He says, I have considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. You should receive instruction from this. Yet a little sleep. Notice again, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. Oh, it's just a little sleep. Oh, it's just sleeping a little bit. Oh, it's just one day I'm just going to call in and, and fake sick. You know, it's just one day here. It's one day there. It's just a little laziness here and there. So shall thy poverty cometh as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. That sound familiar? God's repeating himself for a reason. <clears throat> so we see, sir, first of all, that slothfulness is something that will make you poor. You know, and if you go through your life, look, I'm not saying that if you're poor, you're a bad person. Okay, I mean, there's people that are out there that, that are hardworking, honest people in some places in this world that are just poor, and they're always going to be that way. Because they live in a country where things are difficult, where their government, you know, is, is terrible. You know, people that, you know, that live in places like Cuba and stuff like that, where socialisms take over, they just, they have, there really is no way out of poverty. I get that. But there's also a lot of people that, you know, they, they could do whatever, like people in this country, for instance, that could go out and get as many jobs as they want. They could pull themselves up out of the gutter if they were serious about it, and they choose not to. And it makes them poor, okay? <clears throat> and whether you're poor, poor, if you're a poor person, you know, you are going to suffer to a certain degree in this life. And we see that, you know, being a sleepy, lazy person, that is a source of slothfulness. We also see for the book of Proverbs, and if you would, turn over to Proverbs chapter uh, 18, Proverbs chapter 18, that slothful people are wasteful. They are people that are wasteful people. 
They don't make use of the things that are given to them or even things that they might even perhaps buy on their own. You know, you see this all the time with these derelicts on the side of the road. People give them food, people give them water, people give them sodas even, which I don't know why you give them that in the desert. It's like the last thing that they need is a big sugary soda from QT or whatever. You know, that you're, you're here, have some poison while you're standing out there in 100 degree weather. You know, let me, let me just dehydrate you even more. Right, but what do they do? They take a sip and they set it down and it sits there for the rest of the day. They don't want that. All they want is money. Because they're not looking for food. They're not looking for that. Yeah. They're looking for their next fix. Yep. They're looking to be able to go down to the gentleman's club or whatever. That's you know what a, a stupid name for that place. Yeah. They're looking for it so they can go in there and, and, and just throw your hard earned money down the drain to get there to for their you know sinful habit. That's what they're there for. So they can go down and, and buy drink and buy booze and buy alcohol and buy drugs and all other manner of things that they want to waste money on. They are wasteful people. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 12, The slothful man rose just not that which he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man is, is, is precious. You know, I don't, you know, I love them asking, Hey man, you got some change? You got a few spare dollars? Nope. I'm a diligent man and it's all precious to me. You know, sorry, I'm busy feeding, you know, five other people and myself yeah. to stop and feed you, oh, thou able-bodied individual. <clears throat> my, my substance is precious because I diligently work for it. And if I gave it to you, you know, you didn't, you're not going to do anything uh, uh, profitable with it. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 10, by much slothfulness, the building decayeth, and through idleness of hands, the house droppeth through. Reminds me of that guy in Proverbs chapter 24. Had a vineyard, had a house, had the wall, and just because of his laziness, just let it all go to waste. Let it all just crumble down around and did nothing with it. Look at Proverbs chapter 18, verse 9. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. It's like the same guy. They come from the same family. You see a guy who's a great waster and somebody who is slothful in his work, you'd say, oh, those guys must be related. He's brother to him. <clears throat> this is very true. You know, people that are slothful in work, you know, one, they don't value other people's time. They don't value the fact that they're on somebody else's clock. They don't value that there's people relying on them to get things done. And they're also, you know, they won't they'll value they won't value just wasting your money. You trust them to get certain things or to buy certain things. They'll overspend there, they'll overspend there, and they'll just waste things. <clears throat> The slothful make excuses. That's the next point I want to make. And people make excuses for the slothful today, and they need to stop it. Oh, you don't understand. All oh, those poor guys out there. And they're the ones that are rolling down the window. And I know this is a bit of a hobby horse for me, but I'm going to go ahead and go off on it anyway. People that roll down the window and hand these bums money. Yep. I get more upset with them than I do that bum. Right. I want to say, knock it off. You know, quit enabling that, that derelict to keep living that kind of a life. And people make excuses for them. You don't understand what's like. No, they, you don't understand if you have a bleeding heart for these people. It's a fact. I've known people that have called the local police departments and said, well, you do something about these bumps. And they say, hey, we would love to do something about it, but unfortunately, vagrancy is no longer against the law. Did you know it was a time in this country was against the law to do that? Mm -hmm. To be a panhandler, to be a vagrant, to just be an idle, wandering bum, that you could go to jail for that. You know, and they didn't have the problem that they had back then, but now we have, you know, cities that are just say, they're allowed to put up their tents wherever they want Take within the city limits. They can put them up under the overpasses. Police can't ask them to leave. You can't ask them to leave. And they can sit there and they can, you know, just throw their garbage and their waste and just throw everything right there on the ground and make the place messy and dirty and smelly and dangerous and unhealthy, and there's nothing you can do about it. And, you know, the cops say the biggest problem that we have is, is, you know, all the college students come to town and just give them money. Just, oh, we're just helping this guy out, just give them money. It's the churches, in fact, that are, you know, opening up their doors and you know, having the soup kitchens and, and everything else to let these people just continue to live this derelict life. People who need to hit rock bottom. You know, they, they were, someone was telling me also that when the economy goes down, it, a lot of you watch, if you watch, if this economy tanks, watch how many bums go out and get a job. You know why? Because of the fact that rich, when people don't have money to, uh, are, are suffering, when people that actually work are making less, they don't have money to give out. Right. And the bums go, I guess, you know, 
Well, I guess the boom's over, the bubble burst, time to get back to reality. You know, because people stop giving them money when the economy goes down. And sure enough, they disappear. And that should tell you right there that the only reason they're out there doing that is because they know it works. Because they know if they stand out there with their sign and their, their pathetic look that people will give them money. Look, friend, we drove by there the other week coming back from soul winning. You know, people that work hard during the week come to church and they go out there and knock doors for uh, you know, a few hours on their time off. You know, hardworking people are pulling off the freeway and there's a guy begging, you know, smoking cigarettes, got a haircut, got his Nikes on. Right. And we're looking over and I said, is that a laptop? Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Guy had a laptop sitting over That's there. Right. It's like, go, ha go pawn your laptop, buddy. Yep. Go sell that for your $30 or whatever you need. Eat your cigarettes, and then eat your hat. And then when you're done eating that, go get a job, you right. bum. That's right. It's ridiculous. That's right. But the reason why he's there is because it works. Yep. You know, and I've joked about this more than once in this pulpit. I'm tempted to go down there and just join him on my time off. <laughs> you know, just my day off. I'm saying full three-piece suit and just walk out there with a sign and say, I, that says, I don't need it but I want it. <laughs> Saving for a vacation. You know? Or, or need, to, you know, need to get a new set of tires. Help me out. You know, or just, just you know, ask, you know, want to buy a new gun. <laughs> I wonder if it would work. I'm tempted to do it. Probably. I mean, would it really be sinful if, I, if I'm just doing it on my own time off? I have a job and I'm, I'm just totally honest. Hey, I don't need it. But I, I want it. I'll take it. I mean, if somebody just walked up to me and wanted to hand me a $100 bill, I'd take it. You don't believe me, try me out. You know, see me after service. I'll prove you wrong. Right? But that's, that's what goes on. People make excuses for these people. And they, and, they, and they prey upon that. And the slothful people, they make excuses for themselves all the time, too. You know, not, even, I'm not, you know, not just the derelicts that are out there. I'm saying people who even might even have a job. People who actually work, but they're just kind of considered kind of a, a, a lazy worker. People just kind of keep them around because, well, they're cheap. You know, that, that, that kind of thing goes on, by the way. You know, and, uh, and, 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 But those are the people, when, when the economy gets tough and the company has to start cutting dead weight, they're going to be the first ones to go. You know, that was my mentality that I learned to develop over time as an employee. Is I wanted to be the guy that if things got tight, I'm going to be the last guy they let go. That's how I wanted to be as a worker. But the slothful, you know, they make excuses for themselves. Well, you don't understand, you know, this, that. They'll make all kinds of different excuses. Uh, I don't know if I had you go there, but Proverbs chapter 15. Go to Proverbs chapter 15. Actually, just go to Proverbs 26. I'm sorry, Proverbs 26. The Bible says, I'll read to you from Proverbs chapter 8, 15. The way of the slothful men is as a hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. It says it's as a hedge of thorns. You know, they see, they see, they just perceive all these problems. You tell them to do something, and all they come back to you with is, "Oh, I, I can't do that." Why? Well, because this, this, and this. And they don't, they don't see a path. Uh, they don't have their, they don't have a, a plain path, a way to get through it. They just all they see is a hedge of thorns. But it's as a hedge of thorns. It doesn't say it is a hedge of thorns. It says it's as one. They just look at their way, and they, and they're, they have so many excuses. It's like trying to get them to go through a hedge of thorns. They won't do it because all they do is just perceive problem after problem. They can just make up excuses all day long and tell you why this isn't possible, why this isn't a good idea, why you're asking too much, why, you know, I can't work more than so many hours, you know, and or, you know, I can't, you're, you're asking too much of me. And you know what the problem with a lot of people is? Is that, that come back with this excuse of, well, you know, that's just too much work. It's like, it's like, it's either too much work or you're too slow the way, at the way you do it. You know, a lot of people need to find another gear when it comes to work. I've seen people work and it's just, you watch them work and it's like, you could be doing that twice as fast. Or they don't learn to think things through to become more efficient workers. You know the saying, work smarter, not harder? That's not lazy. That's efficient. Work smarter, not harder, so that you have more time to do what? More work get more done. It's funny how busy people find a way to get things done. You want to get something done? Go find the busiest guy you can. Because that's the guy that has learned to manage his time and get things done. Don't go find a guy who, who has all the time in the world to get things done and, and just see, has a wide open schedule because you know he's probably not the guy that's, that's used to just getting after things. 
So he says it's as a hedge of thorns. People just have all kinds of excuses of why they can't do things. Look at Proverbs chapter 26, verse 12. Seest thou a wise man, seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than him. He's saying, if you see a guy who's wise in his own conceit, in his own pride, he says there's more hope of a fool than him. Because you can't teach him anything. Look at verse 13. The slothful man saith, there is a lion in the way. A lion is in the streets. I can't go to work today because there, you know, the coronavirus. Clearly, you know, this whole week I just have to take it off because I hate to contract the coronavirus and die. I mean, what if I called Pastor Anderson and told him that? You know, I'm just, I'm really concerned that I, you know, the church is real busy. A lot of people come through there. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't deposit the offering, all that money. I don't know who's been touching that until it's all been properly disinfected and I have several layers of latex gloves. I, I just can't even come into work. I need a respirator. I'm not taking a mask. I want the full particle, nanoparticle respirators. I, 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 just, I, just, I should, probably shouldn't even come into this whole thing's over. You think I'd have a job? There'd be somebody else preaching here next week if I had that kind of an attitude. You know, or there'd be at least, at the very least, be a very serious talking to about why you need to just quit making excuses and get something done. You really think there's a lion in the streets? Like this one guy, oh, there's a lion in the way. You think people just let man-eating animals just roam the streets freely? I mean, I know in some parts of Tucson with these pit bulls, it would seem like that, right? <laughs> well, we had that one jump up on a car today. Someone was telling me you could have just lunged at anybody they wanted to. Yeah. I mean, I get it. They got a hand, but do you really think that I mean, we're, I remember in, in Michigan, I remember it was a big deal when some black bear wandered into town, came out of the woods. And it was like news, but you know, what, you know what the news was? It wasn't, everybody stay in. There's a black bear loose in the streets of Traverse City. You know, we wouldn't want anything bad to happen. The story was all about how they were tracking it here and tracking it there. It was last spotted here, last spotted there. And finally the thing got tranked and fell out of a tree and, and drug back out in the woods. People don't just let lions and man-eating animals Wander around. This guy's a liar. Right. This guy's making excuses as why he can't go out, and out to work today. Because there's a lion in the streets. And what's his problem here? It goes on and says in verse 14, As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful on his bed. You know, ever think about how it's such a picture. I love the, 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 the imagery of the Bible. It's talking about, you know, a guy, you just imagine the guy just rolling back and forth, turning on the hinges. When you're at that stage in your sleep cycle, you're not getting deep sleep. You know, that's when you're like, you know you need to get up, you just keep rolling over and rolling over and rolling over. When you're getting good, solid sleep, you're pretty much paralyzed. You don't move. I mean, that's how we test, you know, when one of the kids is, is still in, sleeping in the bed with us. If you lift up the arm and it just falls, you know, you're like, okay, this kid's out. You know, and then you know it, right? Because they're just completely sacked out. You could, you know, you could, you could twist them into a pretzel or something like that. They just wouldn't even move. This guy's rolling back and forth, back and forth. It's time to get out of bed and get after it and not quit making up excuses about this lion. The slothful hideth his hand in his bosom, it grieveth it to bring it to his mouth again. You know, it reminds me of a guy who's like too lazy to even cover his mouth when he like coughs or sneezes or yawns. He's just like, I chill, it's blowing it everywhere. You know, he can't even bring his hand to his mouth. This is how lazy of a person I'm talking about. But look at verse 16. It says, The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. You know, you can sit the sluggard down with the other you know, supervisors and talk to him and try to talk sense in the individual and say, you need to do this, you need to quit doing that, you need to get after it, you need to find another gear, you need to start working hard. And they can sit there and fire right back at you and say, well, no, you, I can't because this, and I can't because this. And, uh, you know, I have this. And I, you know, uh, inability. I have this disability. You guys are making it harder here. And they, all they do is they just come back. I don't know what all the excuses are because I'm not that guy. But they, I'm sure they're out there. And they can just make all these excuses. Then more than seven men that can render a reason. <clears throat> and the, is that often they cannot be corrected. They cannot be corrected. Why? Because they are wiser in their own conceit. That's what it says about the sluggard. It says that the slothful, lazy person is wiser in his own conceit. You cannot correct them. It is in vain to yell at these bumps. It might feel good, right, to get it off your chest. Get a job, get a job you dirty bum. But if you think they're like, oh, why didn't I think of that? You're right. 
let me go shower or gives you instruction on things that you need to change and get better, you need to listen up and you need to do it. Because that's usually like a real strong signal that you're about to get fired when someone is talking to you in that manner and saying, hey, you need to fix this. You need to get this right. Or, you know, they're trying to help you to get right because they, they don't want to go through the whole hiring process again, the awkwardness of having to fire you. They probably even want you to succeed maybe. But you need to listen to that. That's helpful advice to anyone that ever, you know, has a job or gets a job that if you are ever corrected by a supervisor, because nobody's perfect, you know, we're going to make mistakes. You know, and, and I think that's something that helped me succeed in, 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 in jobs is that, and what I learned was that, you know, I would even sit there and take blame for things that I didn't even do. Or I would, I would admit fault for things that I wasn't even responsible for. Just to get it over and so the boss could feel like, hey, this is going to get fixed. Because that's all the boss wants. They just want a solution. They just want to know it's going to get fixed. They'd say, hey, Corbin, you know, we keep going back to this job and this door. And, it's, and, and I'm thinking, we have a, you don't understand. It's because, you know, and I have a perfectly reasonable explanation. But I don't go, well, you, you need to, you know, fire back. I just say, you know what, you're right. I'll get it right. And then I'm able to go back there and, you know, figure something out. Was it my fault? Somebody else did it. They think it's me. Whatever. You see what I'm saying? The boss would rather just know it's going to get fixed, and when you fix it, they're happy. That's all they're looking for. <clears throat> they cannot be corrected because they are wiser in their own seat. See, that is what is said about sluggards. And thus, they are hopeless individuals. If you cannot, if you are the type of person who cannot receive correction, you will not go far in life, I guarantee you. Because I don't care who you are. You're going to make mistakes, something's going to go wrong, and you are going to be corrected to some degree or another, whether rightfully so or not. And if you're the type of person who's always just got to fire back, who's always just got to have some kind of a remark, who's always just got to have some kind of an excuse, you know, people are going to get tired of dealing with that. They can say, every time I correct this guy, you know, he just has, you know, I was talking to a, a, a buddy at church a while ago, and, you know, he, he oversees some people, and they've been begging this guy to be a supervisor for years now, but he refuses to do it because the policies that are in place now where you cannot just reprimand people and that there's just that people can just talk back to supervisors and they can just disobey direct orders and there's just no consequences. I know somebody that works for the city and that this guy, he told this guy to go do this job now and this guy cussed his own super, I mean the guy was a, a foreman on the job and the, the guy under him who's just a normal, you know, general laborer is cussing out the foreman. And the, the foreman's going to his supervisor saying, what are you going to do? And they say, well, unfortunately, it's the city. We can't do anything about it. You know, he has rights because of the union. And the foreman ended up going and doing what he was told that guy to do after he cussed him out. That's the world we're living in today. So maybe I'm wrong to say that. You know, go work for the city, and you can have a bad attitude. You can take dis disobey all you want. You can keep your job. And you can keep have the stigma that goes along with work, being a city employee as well. And I work for the city, and that stigma is well deserved in many instances. Anyway, here's the point I'm making, is that people that cannot receive correction are going to find themselves unemployed. And people that cannot receive correction are usually people that are wiser in their own seat. They're, they're sluggardly people. They're lazy. They're more concerned about just justifying why they don't do what they're supposed to do than they are actually getting something done. It says in Proverbs chapter 10, go over to Proverbs, uh, go to Proverbs chapter 14. It says in Proverbs chapter 10, as vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the slugger to, him, to them that send him. He's saying, look, when they send this guy, when you send this guy to go do something, you give him a task to accomplish. And because he's a slugger, it doesn't get done right, it doesn't get on time, or it doesn't get done at all. It says that individual is like vinegar to the teeth. Now, I've never drunk, you know, straight vinegar, but I can't imagine that's a very pleasant experience. You know, let me bring it in the modern, modern vernacular. It's like chewing tinfoil. Who's ever chewed tinfoil? Oh, man, that's weird. <laughs> I never have. I've never done it. But I just the thought of it, you know, chewing tinfoil, you know, you leave the wrapper. Did you leave the wrapper on the kiss? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You pop the kid's in, and it's like, ah! Oh, but it didn't take long you to figure out there was tinfoil in my mouth. Just, you know, that's a, just a real awkward thing to, 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 to do. I mean, just the thought of chewing on tinfoil, you know, the thought of vinegar on your teeth, it's irritating. 
You know, and it's, it's a smoke to the eyes. You know, when you're at the, the campfire, the smoke always seems to go in your eyes. Everyone's always moving away from it. So is the slugger to them that send him. That's the way it is when you're the type of person who gets told something, yeah, okay, I'll go do it. Right. And the person that sends you is like, could you move a little <laughs> faster? I suppose. You know, and they just drag their feet. You know, it, it's like if it's such a if it's such a woeful task, if it's just such an unpleasant thing you've been asked to do, wouldn't you be in a hurry to go get it done and get it over with? That's what I've never understood about people who just want to drag things out. Oh, I can't believe I have to do this. And they just complain all the time. It takes twice as long. If it's that unpleasant, just get it over with. And it'll be done. And you can go back to whatever you were doing. But when you're the type of person who drags their feet to do what they're supposed to do, complains on the way, makes excuses why they can't do it, you're like, you're like vinegar to the teeth. You're like... You're like tinfoil to the, to, the, to, the, to the teeth, right? You're like smoke to the eyes. You're obnoxious. You're irritating. It's frustrating to deal with these type of people. And what happens is, you know, there's some kind of a consequences. Whether it's a child in the home, you know, there's probably a consequence that comes with that kind of an attitude if things are being done right. If you're an employee, you know, there's going to be consequences. People get tired of working with people like that. Those people just get fired. Just say, look, the guy's just not getting it. He's not going to correct. He's not going to fix this. He's going to continue to be sluggard. He's going to continue to just be a smoke in my eyes. And, you know, and just it's bad for the team. It's bad for the work environment. He's got to go. People do not just put up with that kind of an attitude. People need to learn that that's the type of thing that's going to cause you to suffer. If you're a sluggardly person, you're going to suffer for it by losing your job. <clears throat> no one wants to work with such an individual. The Bible says confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth. You know, I was just telling, uh, I was just saying the other night that, you know, I have a real thing when it comes to teeth and fingernails. Like, I can watch, you know, I can walk and see somebody's, like, just gaping flesh wound and be like, oh, man, that looks pretty rough. You gonna get stitches? But if it's your nails or your teeth or anything like that, I just can't handle it. I don't know what it is. It's just, ooh, it gets squeamish. Especially the teeth. Teeth injuries, I can't even, I don't, if you ever hurt your mouth and your teeth, don't come show me. Uh, I can't handle it, all right? <laughs> Let me throw that out there, you know, while we're on the subject. But he's saying, look, the confidence in a person who's unfaithful, who's not going to get things done the way you want it done, it's like having a broken tooth. Anyone who's ever had any kind of uh, dental problem, you don't just forget about that. It's not like you wake up in the morning and go, oh, you know, what was that? You have a little twinge in the back or something pops, hurts for a second. You forget it on your, you know, within minutes. Man, you have a you have an exposed nerve or a cavity or something. Man, it's just always there, always gnawing all day long. You can't forget it. It just keeps coming up. That's what an unfaithful person is like. They're like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. I mean, your foot goes out of joint. You're not able to walk. You're gonna, I mean, you're gonna have to deal with that immediately. You're gonna be constantly thinking about, oh, I, I can't walk on that foot. You can't put any weight on it. That's what, an un, that's what it's like putting your confidence in an unfaithful man. It's just something that's irritating, it's always there, it's painful, and eventually just needs to be dealt with. You're there in Proverbs chapter 14, look at verse 23. It says, In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. You know, penury, you know, becoming poor. That's what the talk of the lips tendeth to. People just want to stand around and talk. You know, the 15-minute break becomes a 30-minute break. Right. And this type of thing is out there. I've known people, I've worked at places, you know, where they, you know, let me just go ahead and say it, the city, okay? I'm not disparaging anyone that works for the city. But when I worked for the city for over a year, I learned that their stigma is well-deserved, as I said earlier. And you had people there that would be on the other side of this campus, and, oh, it's, you know, it's 9 o'clock, it's time for our 15-minute break. You think they just stopped there and took their 15-minute break? No, they came 10 minutes across the campus to the break room, took their 15-minute break, and then went 10 minutes back. And, and so what? Now that 15-minute break just turned into, what, 35 minutes. And then two hours later, lunch rolled around. Same thing. Got to go all the way back. I knew people at other county jobs. Man, they would, they would, drive, they would drive miles back to the shop and start their break. And then, they, you know, and then they would drive miles back 
just to take their break. When you, and you go do that at a private company and see how long you have your job for. Yeah. You know, you're, you're supposed to be out in the field working somewhere. The boss is back in the office, and you show up at 12 o'clock for lunch. What are you doing here? It's lunchtime. <laughs> well, you ever heard of a lunch pail? You ever heard of ice? Right. You know, you ever hear of a thermos? You get back out there. Right. Take your lunch in the field. That would happen, like, one time, if that. That would probably be the last lunch you ever took at a company like that. But there's people that make a practice out of that on a daily basis. <clears throat> And it says the talk of the lips and the tenth only to penury. You know, somebody's going to lose money because people are just being lazy. But you know, the beginning of that verse is just a great lesson. The Bible says there that in all labor, there is profit. You know, and I don't believe it's referring to just money. You know, you could go, and I've said this before, you could go out and work for somebody for free and learn something and be profited by it. You would learn some skill. You would learn how to work hard. You would learn something. I guarantee if you went and worked for somebody and they didn't even pay you, you would profit from it. Or take a very low wage. You know, like an apprenticeship. You know, some labor, you know, you benefit from it later. By putting in the labor, putting in the work, learning a trade, learning a craft. You might not see a lot of profit, but it's there. But the profit really comes later. After you've proven yourself, after you've acquired skills. And some people never want to go through that process. They just want the they want the you know the thirty the twenty to thirty dollar job just handed to them, right out of the gate. Well, what skills do you have? Well, none, but I'll get them. I promise. You know, oh, uh, what what abilities do you have? Oh, I don't have any. How long have you been working? Not very long at all. Well, yeah, sure. Let me just pay you you know twenty eight bucks an hour for you to come do this high skilled labor. That's not how it works. Right. You got to start at the bottom and work your way up to that position. You have to arrive at that. But people don't want to go for that process because they don't understand that even down here at the at the lower, you know, at the at the beginning, at the at the low rung of the ladder, that there is profit in climbing that ladder one rung at a time. There's profit all along the way, becoming more valuable, you know, more skilled, having more abilities, becoming worth more and more as you go along the way. You know, I remember, you know, had. When I first read this, it reminded me of a situation I got. I was working for a poured wall company. Now, roofing and poured walls, I don't know which is harder, but I'm glad that season's over. <laughs> okay, Because that's tough work, pouring eight-foot concrete, four-inch wide walls with panels. Anyone, has anyone ever done that kind of work here? No one even know what I'm talking about? We have to peel the panels off and pull them out of the basement. And it, it was hard work. And, uh, I mean, it was one of those type of jobs where, you know, there was a high turnover rate just because, one, of the people, People really didn't want to do that work for very long because it's just so demanding and, and backbreaking. But I remember there's this one guy there, and we're peeling all the panels off the wall after we poured it. And you have to you have to take a hammer and just beat all the concrete that's spilled over onto these things that's dried hard. Just beat concrete off of them. I'm talking like eight foot, you know, three foot wide panels that were aluminum, still very heavy. Some of them were were steel or wood with like steel ribs in them. Real heavy stuff, and load them into these cages so this crane could pull them out. Really hard work. And there was this one guy, every time he walked by you, he had to like just make some joke or stop and start talking. And we're all just like, you know, banging. I remember after work that job, I this I would wake up in the morning and this one finger I'd have to pull it open every morning just from swinging that hammer so much. And it's gone now, but for for years after that job, that hand that hammer like permanently damaged did some damage to my hand. But so this is the kind of work I'm involved in. And this one guy, just every time he walked by, he just wanted, hey, and just talk about anything. You know, and you're just like, dush, dush, like what? And finally, I just, I turned to him, I just said this, like caveman talk. I said, let's talk, more work. And I just went right back at it. And this is like an older guy, you know, and he probably should have figured some things out by then. I don't know what he was doing down in that ditch with some punk kid like me. But there he was. And I just said that, and I didn't know it, but my supervisor was like up there kind of watching how things were going, and he, he saw me do that. And he later at break, he's like, I like that attitude. And he gave me a 25 cent raise. Nice. That, because I ran on the job site. He asked me to go get something, I just, I just run for it and get it, because I wanted that job. Because I understood there was profit in it, you know? But I, I remember that, that reminds me of that every time, the talk of the lips, that tend to only depend on me just telling that guy, more talk, or less talk, more work. Right? But what are we talking about? We're talking about the suffering that slothful people go through because of their laziness. 
And what do they suffer? They suffer the fact that, you know, they will find themselves poor and unemployed if they have this slothful, conceited attitude. They will find themselves um, just being people that learn to just make excuses for themselves and never accept correction. And that they will be, you know, become very poor people as a result, unnecessarily. And here's what I want us to understand tonight is that they bring it to themselves upon themselves and they should not be pitied. You should not pity the slothful or the sluggardly. And we shouldn't feel sorry for them. They need to, they need a swift kick in the pants and need to and learn how to work and get a job. They bring it upon themselves and should not be pitied. <clears throat> the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 4, the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg and have harvest and have nothing. This isn't saying he shall not plow by reason of the cold, therefore he shall beg and harvest, and, and, and everybody will hand out to him. He's saying, look, he should beg and harvest and have nothing. And then the next time, when it's time to go out and plow, he's probably not going to care so much what the temperature is. Because he's going to remember, oh, last harvest I begged and I had nothing. I had nothing. You know, and now he's going to suffer the consequences for being a sluggard. The Bible says the desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. He brings it upon himself. They shouldn't be pitied. The slothful man saith, there is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. There it is again, that same just weird, strange, made-up excuse. I'll be slain if I go out there. You're a liar. You're a sluggard. You're a lazy. You're a bum. They're full of excuses, Right? Both real and made up. I mean, they'll make up things, or they might even have excuses that are real. But that doesn't make them right. That means they just need to deal with it. In either case, these people need to learn, and they need to suffer and learn their lesson. That's sometimes the only thing that will teach these people, is for them to suffer. And then they learn their lesson. Which, again, brings me back to that bumper sticker that I'm still waiting for. Don't feed the bums. Right? I want that on every car in every city in this country. Don't feed the bums. You go to the park, don't feed the bears. You come to the city, don't feed the bums. It should be a policy that everyone abides to. Because, again, going back to what I said earlier, you're not really feeding them. And if you would, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I know this is a review for us, but we're going to go over it again. <clears throat> how, how cruel. How could you say that about these people? Don't feed them. Let them starve. Look, you let them go hungry and they'll get a job. Yep. They'll, they'll sell the laptop. They'll quit buying cigarettes. And they'll go get the job. That's what they'll do. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. <coughs> For even when we are with you, we, this we command you, that if any should not, would not work, neither should he eat. I mean, can the Bible be any plainer about the subject? If you don't work, you don't eat. And if that were the policy that people had in their lives and, and practiced towards other people, refuse to labor, there'd be a lot less unemployment. These streets would get cleaned up. I wouldn't be able to count one person out there being a lazy derelict if people practiced this. But churches don't even understand this these days. And he says, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, not working at all, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by the Lord Jesus Christ that, they, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. And quit being bums and quit being beggars and quit trying to just mooch off everybody else. <clears throat> Again, you know, there's, there's more bums in a successful economy be, because of the fact that people are, just have more money to just hand these people. And they, because they don't understand the Bible. And the Bible's telling you not to feed them. Don't feed these bums. <clears throat> You know, the irony is that, that people that are handing out this money and giving them to them, it's like, I, I just want to ask them, like, how did you come to be so successful where you just had this money to, be, to give away? Was it by being that guy? I mean, do you think that guy got, you know, had, got a bank account where he could just start handing out money to just random strangers with cardboard signs by being that guy? Of course not. That guy who, who, who got that position, he did that by not being an idle bum. By not somebody who makes excuses, by not somebody who's just a sleepy, slothful individual, but by somebody who works hard, gets up early, stays up late, and gets after it. You know, and fights through being tired, and fights through, you know, uh, being having a little sniffle here and there, whatever. That type of a person is a person that succeeds. 
and is not going to suffer in life. <clears throat> the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 12, the hand of the diligent shall bear rule. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule. They're going to be the ones in charge. Who's going to make management? Who's going to be the supervisor? Who's going to be the owner? The diligent person. It's not going to be the bum. It's not going to be the sluggard on the job who just every time you ask him to do something has nothing but an excuse why he can't do it. Never going to be supervisor. Never going to be manager. Never going to run his own company because he's too lazy to do all those things. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. They're going to be the ones getting taxed and getting and being put to work, you know, making somebody else money. <clears throat> and you know what? I know I've been just, this has been all applied so far to just, you know, people, you know, and the, 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 you know, the workforce and things like that. But we could say the same thing spiritually. We could apply all these points to, to ourselves spiritually. <clears throat> you know, go over to, uh, go over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. What if we applied these same things spiritually this evening? The Bible says in Proverbs 23, Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine bibbers and among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man in rags. Now, we should stay far away from these type of people. They'll just drag you down. But we can, we can apply this spiritually. It says in Romans 12, verse 9, let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another, not slothful in its business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You know, we shouldn't be slothful, in, of course, in our jobs, but we should not be slothful in serving the Lord either. You know, how we need to, sometimes we need to check there. Are we getting lazy when it comes to our spiritual service? Are we getting lazy when it comes to our Bible reading? or our church attendance, or our soul winning, or any of these areas where we need to be fervent in spirit. You know, it's real easy for us to just pick on these bums out there, and they deserve every bit of it that they get until they learn to pick themselves up and go earn an honest living. And believe me, there'll be plenty more times where I go off on them because it's just a constant irritation because they're constantly there. <clears throat> but you know what? It's another thing for us to look within and apply these things to ourselves and ask ourselves, Spiritually speaking, maybe everything's going great at work. You know, maybe we're getting the raise and the promotions, and we've got plenty of money, and the bills are paid, and there's food on the table, and everyone's fat and sassy and, and happy. But how are we doing spiritually? Are we kind of like, well, you know, I, I can't do the soul winning, or I can't do the Bible reading because, you know, my schedule. I can't make it happen, or, you know, I can't get to church because, well, you know, I just, I don't feel like it. Are we making, are we being this exact same way, just making the excuses? Just coming up with an excuse of why we can't do the spiritual things? The things that we need to be doing fervently? Because here's the thing, those things are the things that are going to last for eternity. Those are the things that, those are the treasures that we sell into heaven that are going to, are going to last forever. All the money we make down here, all the stuff that we collect, all the nice things that we have, are all for naught. They're temporary. They're not. They're 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 the wood, hay, and stubble. They're going to burn up. But how hard are we working for the gold, the silver, and the precious stones? Now, praise God, we've got a church that are full of people that are, are busy spiritual people. There's not this church is not filled with a bunch of spiritual bums, and I'm grateful for that. You know, and I don't ever want to be a part of a church that's like that. I don't ever want to be a part of a church that's just a lazy, you know, selfish church. That all they're ever concerned about is just. Taking it easy. You know, we had 50, <clears throat> what was it, 55 soul winners? Is that what it was? That's the most people I've ever led on a soul winning expedition ever in the history of me doing it. Granted, I've only done it for a little over a year. You know, that's the biggest I've ever done. And you know what? It was one of the just easiest things I've ever, it was probably one of the easiest soul winning things I've, uh, of, um, trips I've ever had. Because everybody there was fervent. They all, I gave them all very clear directions. Everybody was diligent to make sure that they did what they needed to do and report to who they needed to report to and move on to the next phase of the trip. And, and it's, everything went smooth. And as a result, over 20 people got saved that day. You know, and we knocked a lot of doors and, and the seed got planted. Why? Because, he, because we're dealing with people who are, who are fervently serving the Lord. They're not spiritual bums either. They're hardworking people, both in their, you know, their secular life and when it comes to serving God. 
<clears throat> Let's go ahead and turn over to uh, go over to Hebrews chapter six. Hebrews chapter six. The Bible says, I'll begin reading in verse nine. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. You want God to remember you and what you did down here? You know, you're going to have to put in some elbow grease. You're going to have to get after. You're going to have to actually do something worth remembering. Oh, you know what? Lord, you know, where's my reward? Remember me. You know, I'm here. Remember me, what I did for you? Well, what did you do for me? Oh, man, that's a good question. I'm not sure, but I'm sure I did something. Well, I'm going back over your timesheets. You know, I see a lot of time for everything you like doing. You know, and by the way, I like serving the Lord. I think it's exciting. It's, it's great to get out there and fellowship with different people and, and get to know one another. And we get stories every time we go out soul winning. You know, we almost get attacked by dogs or not always, but sometimes. <laughs> you know, we always have these crazy soul winning stories or, you know, we rescue a dog out there today. This, this guy's dog, this long haired, burned out, gray haired hippie. You know, it looked like a, I don't know, I shouldn't go off on it, but, you know, his little puppy, Marley, just comes running out of the door, just, you know, licking me, licking him, just running all over the place. Marley, get back here, Marley, get back here. It's crazy, it's a funny story. It looked like, you know, Dr. Emmett Brown from that movie over there. This long-haired, burst out dude. And he's like, I'm not interested. Marley, and, he, and we're like, we're grabbing the dog and trying to, we grab the dog, Matt's making, gets pulling him in by the scruff of his neck. The guy starts pulling him in, and the dog gets away again and he runs off again. Oh, just let him go. <laughs> All right, well, have a nice day, sir. Sorry about that. Slams the door. You go on to the next house. Marley's just <laughs> all over us. Follows us like a total of two blocks back to the church van. I look at Matt, and I'm like, man, we should return this dog. What do you think? He's like, yeah, probably. That'd be the right thing to do. So he wrangles the dog. And I'm sitting in there, like, just put him on my lap. I've still got Marley on me. <laughs> so he puts this dog, I got this dog, just, you know, in my lap in the church van. We go back to the guy's house, go knock at his door. I got your dog, you know? <laughs> oh, thanks, thanks. Yeah, have a nice day. And that's a funny story, I thought. I mean, yeah. how often did that happen? You know, but that wouldn't happen if I wasn't, you know, wanting to go out and serve God. Brother Matt didn't want, you know, if he wanted to just go home and, Take a nap. You know, probably all of us probably wanted to do that. You know, I'm not saying, and if you do for time, you know, if that's something you do, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm saying that's all you do every time there's time to go soul winning. You're not making any time ever in your schedule to go out and do some soul winning. And I know, you know, some people are just, you know, busy moms and things like that. They have, they're, they're busy raising little soul winners and stuff like that. I get it, Okay. But I'm just saying, if we have opportunity to go out and serve, are we taking advantage of it? Or are we saying, eh, I don't feel like it. Well, don't see, be surprised when you get to heaven and God you know, has nothing for, for you to remember when it comes to your work and your labor of love, which you have showed toward his name and have ministered to the saints and do minister. You know, here's my time sheet, Lord. Man, it's, it's looking a little thin, looking a little light when it comes to serving the Lord. I see you had time for the lake. I see you had time for this recreation and this pleasure and all this, and I'm not saying there's things wrong with that, but where are we cutting out time for him? Or are we just being lazy with him? And he says in verse 11, we desire that every one of you to show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You know, God doesn't want a bunch of lazy kids. He says, hey, I want you to go preach the gospel to every creature. <sighs> Okay. <laughs> like some JW. You know, just running around. Guess if I have to, I'll go out and preach. You think God's pleased with that? Not at all. It's not going to count for anything. So go back to Proverbs. Uh, where do we have to start? Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. <clears throat> you know, if you want to succeed, whether it's, you know, in the workforce or whether it's spiritually when it comes to serving God, Here's some real good advice. Go to the ant. Go to the ant. Is that not what we read in the beginning? Was that not the advice that was given to the slugger? Go to the ant, thou slugger. He's saying you need to go to the ant and consider her ways and be wise. 
You know, if we would observe that little creature and the way it works and the way it behaves, you know, we could learn from it. We could become wise and be profitable people, not only to our parents, not only to our employers, but to the Lord himself. If we would go to the end and consider it, what does he do? She provided, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. I mean, it's a great day when you have somebody who do, does what they need to do without having to be told. You know, and that's one of the real, uh, you know, defining attributes of what it's considered to be an adult. You know, people that want to be considered an adult, that's really what makes you an adult. Is when somebody doesn't have to come to you and say, it's time to do this. Time to do this, right. time to do this, time to do this, and time to do this. You want to be a mature person? You want to mature and become an adult? Learn to do things without being told. Mom or dad come to you, hey, it's time to, it's already done. Oh, wow. Who are you? What have you done with my child? Right? They'll be pulling on your skin. Is that a clever disguise? Is that really an alien under there? You know? It's time to go, all right, it's done. I did it already. Well, what about, yeah, I did that too. And here's the thing, you know they're going to ask, why do we wait to be asked to do things? Because we don't want to do them, right? Because we're hoping, well, maybe they'll forget, and then I won't have to do it, right? That's a lazy attitude. That's a slothful attitude. I'm not going to do it until they tell me, right? Why not just get it done if it's that bad? Just get it done, get over with, and you'll look like an adult. He, go to the ant, thou sluggard. She has no guide, no overseer or ruler. I remember when I got hired, I was told, I don't want to hold your hand. Those words ring in my ears. I don't want to hold your hand. I don't want to hold your hand. Just every time I have a question, hey, how do I do, hey, what if I, what do you, are you okay with just, how am I supposed to, no. Employers want people who are just going to figure it out and get it done. Just say, here's what I want to happen, make it happen. True. That's what they want. And if you're that type of person, who can be given a task, given a project, and say, make this happen, and then you do it, you're going to succeed. Yep, and you're going to be like the ant, who doesn't have somebody just standing over them, watching them. You know, that's why a lot of places have to hire managers and supervisors, is to sit there and watch other people to make sure those people are doing what they're supposed to. That's their whole job. Make sure they come to work on time, make sure they punch out when they're supposed to, Make sure they're working while they're there, making sure that they do things the way they're supposed to be done. That's, that's their whole purpose. And here's the thing. If those people didn't have to exist, the company could pay those people, the other people they're supposed to be watching, even more money. I mean, they, we would love to pay you more, but we have to pay this guy to watch, make sure you do what you do. And that's why he makes more money than you. <laughs> people want to, people who will just do things without having to be told. And so that's really, you know, uh, a good, good uh, attitude to adopt, to be that kind of a person. The type of person who just, and if you want to go over to Proverbs chapter 13, we'll close. The type of person who just sees what needs to be done and just does it. You know, the person who, as the Bible says, walks circumspectly. I'll never forget that. When I, you know, my last pastor, he was a roofer, and he sat and he took me aside one time. And he said, you need to, when you go around the job site, wherever we are, you develop an attitude of somebody who learns how to walk circumspectly. You know, not redeeming the time for the days are evil. You know, but he's saying that same concept with circumspectly, you need to be looking around, you know, circumspectly. And as you walk circumspectly, you take note of things. This tool is here. If anybody asks for it, I know where it is. I know where I last saw that or where this is. Or you see something that needs to be picked up. This drives me nuts. Like, People who will just see a piece of garbage and go, oh, yeah, there's garbage right there, so why don't you pick that up? <laughs> and just walk right over it and think, oh, well, somebody else will get that. What's wrong with you bending over and picking that up and throwing it away? Amen. <clears throat> Someone who sees what needs to be done and just does it without being told. That's the type of person that's going to succeed. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter uh, 13, verse 4, The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing. I mean, those people that are, are out there begging... You know, they desire things. They, they might want the next meal. They want, might want to have a roof over their head. They might want to have, you know, a change of clothes. They want to have all these things, but you know what they have? They have nothing. But the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. The person who's willing to work, he's going to have all those things. He's going to have the hot meal and dessert. 
You know, he's going to be in a caloric excess all the days of his life, you know. And he's going he's gonna to have everything that he needs. These are the type of people that we, we need in our, in, our, you know, in our homes, in our churches, in our, in our places of work. We need people that can be like the ant, walk circumspectly, see what needs to be done, and do it. <laughs> you know, and regardless of whatever society, policy society adopts or whatever their attitude is, you know, if some socialist gets in there and just wants to, you know, make it, you know, an even playing field where everybody's equal and there's no, you know, you know, wants to start paying people, you know, 20 bucks an hour to flip burgers or whatever and keep raising minimum wage, whatever, you know, social policy is embraced that is anti-Bible, that is unbiblical, you know, we should still continue to pattern our lives for success in God's economy and not after the world. You know, like, well, I only work 40 hours. That's not God's economy. That's not. not you know, God's economy is six days shalt thou labor. Right. Now, if you work a job where you only work 40 hours, great. You know, but it gives you more time to do things for the Lord, I guess. But, and that should just be, well, I, you know, if the company comes and says, hey, we need you to actually work 45. We need you to work 50. Well, you know what? There was a law enacted that says, you know, unless you pay me over, you know, that's, that's not God's economy. That's the world's economy. And we should pattern our lives after the way God wants things done. And not be lazy people, but be people that are diligent in our work. And if we do that, if we're diligent and we do the work, we shall receive the reward. We will turn in a timesheet to heaven and say, I've been busy, Lord. I serve you fervently. You know, I got after it. I did something for you. I was a busy person for the Lord. And God will say, great, well, here's your reward. And we'll have something. And God is not uh, unjust. To, he, will, he will remember things that we've done towards his name. So let's go ahead and pray.